Hello and welcome to Leaders Talk. Our guest today is the world-renowned thinker in complexity and methodologist Dave Snowden. And also chaos, people get chaos wrong. They think it exists. I want to see this frequently. They say, you know, the traffic in Mumbai is chaotic. Well, it isn't actually. If you walk in a straight line across the road at a constant speed, nothing will hit you. Yeah. Um, the first time I drove the Orfini coast from Sorrento, it felt like chaos, but actually I now know the way Italian drivers drive. It's follow the next car, match speed, avoid collision. Now I understand the heuristics, I can drive confidently, right? So those are complex systems. Leaders Talk, the interview podcast portraying leaders who are committed to better leadership, better organizations and a better world. Hosted by managing partner of Leadership Choices and co-founder of the Cosmic Foundation, Carsten Rath. With Dave, I am discussing the origins of the Kinefin framework, uh, what it actually means, what leaders can derive from it. Also, we are discussing how sense-making and detection of early weak signals actually works in an organizational settings, how leaders um, can become curious about what's talked about in water coolers and how to derive actions or, let's say, experiments um, in order to see how to influence the system and get more uh, of the behavior or the results that you want to achieve and less of those that you don't want to achieve and all of that um, and the limitations of it and the limitations of traditional system thinking and what s drawing mapping is. All of that will be just discussed in this fascinating and quite frankly, quite mind-blowing um, talk with Dave. But let's go right into the interview with Dave Snowden. Dave, good morning and welcome to Leaders Talk. Yeah, pleasure to be with you. Dave, where are you right now and why are you there? And why is it six o'clock in the morning? <laughs> it's, it's Washington, D.C., so, which was part of my life for many years before and after 9-11. Uh, when we were working on DARPA programs. So it's almost like a second home in some ways. But now I've been here for a big conference. And then the weekend, we went upstate New York to a wonderful place called the Swimming Hill. And we were working on the book then. So we got the book designed. That was myself, my daughter, Mary, yeah, and one other. And now I'm back in DC and we're running a whole series of, well, a retreat, which is our sort of R&D effort with our network. And then a course on Esther on, on Friday. Then I go home. For a couple of days. For two days, literally, before you hit the plane again, as you just told <laughs> yeah. me. So, um, Dave, how would you describe yourself? I mean, the simple question, who are you? Um, yeah, I, th I think if you're Welsh, I always share this with Maori. Um, if, if I gave you my name in Welsh, it would be David Adiago. And if I was true Welsh, I could actually go on with for several more ads going back seven generations. So it's that sort of story. And you see the same with Maori. You don't have a conversation with Maori till you explain your background. So I did a degree in physics and philosophy, um, which was an indulgence when I did it, um, but proved quite useful afterwards. I worked in the World Council of Churches or rather the WSCF, which was a subset of that for four or five years on. And that got me overseas a lot. And there's quite shocking stuff, to be honest, on indigenous land rights and in Zimbabwe and elsewhere. And then went through a career in industry and ended up a strategy director of a company. And then IBM took us over. And that was 20 years ago now. And basically pushed me into a pure research role. That was 27 years ago. Yeah, 20 years ago, I left them. Um, and that was the idea was to develop new methods and tools. And that's what I'd been doing. I mean, I, I created three software businesses as general manager within the company and then moved into a strategy role. And I've always been a methodologist, I think. If you wanted one word, which is take concepts, takes ideas, and from that create methods and tools yeah, um, that other people can use. So in our open source wiki, I think we've got well over 100 now, um, together with major frameworks, together with the software that we developed. So that's what I do, right? But I'd also say that we've been pioneering a completely new approach to doing research. So if we identify an issue or a problem, yeah, or an opportunity, we first of all spend several years reading around the subject in the natural sciences. So we do not take an empirical approach. 
because you can't get a, a proper sample. You're too context dependent. I just don't buy 99% of the management books because I don't trust their source. Um, on the other hand, the way that human beings make decisions, the nature of systems, the nature of rhizomic structures in nature, these are not only well-researched, but they've been subject to peer re review and repeated experiments. So what we do is we then build a method or tool consistent with that theory. And that takes about five, six years. Then we start to experiment it in practice and we modify it, but only consistent with the theory. And that gives us stuff which is consistent, which can be used in different contexts. Okay, so in other terms, um, you're using human systems, but rather than treating it as a social science, you're going to natural science, looking for analogies and that are well researched, and then using for patterns and principles that can be applied back into human systems. Yeah, and it's um, it's my background as a physicist, I think to some extent, or I, though I'm more a philosopher, but um, from a physicist's point of view, no social scientist ever has enough data to form any valid conclusion anyway. And if you look at the current crisis in psychology, um, people are trying to repeat the experiments and with a few exceptions and not getting the same results because the context has switched, they over constrain their variables. And part of the problem is they were using scientific methods designed for ordered systems rather than scientific methods designed for complex systems. Yeah, and I think that's what they got wrong. And complexity is a major switch. I mean, it's sort of started to come in over the last few decades in terms of the way you work. So roughly speaking, yes, right? And they, there was a time in human history where there was no Kinevin framework. Mm -hmm. um, and and mm. what, what, what were the frame conditions that you said, I need to do something about this? We need to put uh, it into so, a framework. Um, I, I, yeah, IBM had taken over our company, which happened over a weekend. It was quite scary. We thought we were floating on the stock market and three days before we were an IBM subsidiary. Um, but I was considered the creative. So I created a thing called the Genus program, which had put together legacy management, Rad Jad, early stage agile. I was one of the founders of DSDM, which went into the agile manifesto. Um, and and that had included soft systems from Peter Checkland and two or three other things. And that was that turned the company around. Yeah, so the idea of integrating things and moving them out had worked. So IBM put me into an interesting role, which was, look, we'll pay you a salary, just go and do interesting things. And in one year, I was targeted on upsetting people. It was basically, IBM's going to be a service company. You're going to do things which will irritate some powerful people. And I slightly overachieved on that target, right? Um, and the first thing which was coming through then was knowledge management. And my background was in decision support. That's where I, that was my thesis. That's actually what I built my early career on. Yeah, working with the boards of people like Guinness Company, Merce Shipping, yeah, in the early days of computing, saying we can now manage information flow much better and handling that human computer interface. So I was working on that and we picked up two or three things. One is I got to know Max Brasso, um, who tragically died a few years ago. His book, Knowledge Assets, is a classic. He and I then started to work together. Um, and I was also heavily getting into how do we map decisions and information flow? Because to ask people what they know, which is what all the consultants were doing, is just plain stupid. Yeah, we only know what we know when we need to know it. It's contextual. So we started to map decisions. To get to decisions, we started to map narrative. Yeah, And then complexity was starting to hit mainstream then well mainstream in those of us who do early stage thinking yeah um and the early versions of Kinevin in an article called complex acts of knowing which is the third major article were really about knowledge management in informal and formal communities and how you manage the switch between the two and the narrative acts actually was getting big right so we had an IBM story group which is my group in the UK Watson labs communication Lotus labs and that came to the attention of DARPA, or more specifically, some people in DARPA. So I got summoned down to um, Langley for the first time, which was a bit of a shock. But, you know, you, you do what you do, right? Uh, those of us who are good Welsh socialists did not expect this sort of thing, but it is what happened. 
I met a really nice old guy. We had a wonderful conversation about um, Patrick O'Brien's novels of Napoleonic warfare, which went on for about an hour and obviously irritated everybody else in the room. And then I realised I was talking with Admiral John Poindexter, who was Reagan's national security advisor. Um, so that was a bit of a shock to the system. But by that time, I decided I liked him. I still have a huge amount of respect for him. And we got pulled into DARPA programmes. So we were actually in the Pentagon the day before 9-11. I flew out that night, picked up the news the next day. And within weeks, I was being flown back into Washington because we were working on weak signal detection. So how do you identify when a civilian population is going from tacit to explicit support of terrorism? And then that was a large part of my life. It was an experimental program before 9-11. In fact, we concluded it that day successfully. And then it became a, a very serious program. Yeah, so that, that was coming around the stuff. And then IBM, to be quite honest, just became impossible. Um, yeah, when, when Lou Gerstner left, as far as I'm concerned, that was the end of days. Yeah, And I did his leadership training, um, but not, not for his successors. And, you know, Singapore government came along um, because they monitored DARPA and they already had a really good relationship with the Ministry of Defence. I was an advisor to them. And basically said, come along and build our you know, risk assessment and the rising scanning centre. You'll do half of it. These guys will do the other half. You do the complex bit, which is when I got to know Peter Schwartz. And both of us are the lead architects on that. And that sort of then built the company. I mean, that's a bit of a rambling thing, but that's the sort of main scaffolding, the skeleton of what happened. And there were lots of things around that. So the Kinevin framework and weak signal detection that actually came about in the context of geopolitics? No, it was it was actually knowledge management. Um, I did a study. I looked at, at the early days of adoption of KM in IBM. And the ratio between formal and informal communities was 1 to 60. And those are only the ones using the technology. And that basically said to me, uh, informal networks actually have more value. And we have a much lower energy cost. And the energy thing is really dominant now in the work we're doing in Estroy. So the energy cost of simulating and managing a informal network is far less than a formal system. So what you should do is simulate that. And when you get good results, you can stabilize things into the formal system. And then I was starting to look at complexity theory. And then complexity theory got overlaid onto Kinevin. It started in knowledge management, right? So it was looking at formal, informal communities, crisis communities, stable communities. And I drew it once at University of Aston and with that bit in the middle. And I was pretty sure that was important. So I sort of left it there. Um, and then that sort of developed. And Kinevin really took about 20 years before it stabilized. And that's the nature of frameworks. If you have a good framework, you don't just do it once based on a study of six companies. You're modifying it. You leave unresolved tensions in it. Yeah, and it, then it rapidly became a complexity framework. It was effectively competing with Ralph Stacey, um, which is a very different approach, because for him everything is about postmodernism. It's about perception. And Kinevin, I think there were probably three distinguishing factors. One is I come from a materialist background in in philosophy. I'm not a postmodernist. I think reality exists, and they should you know, start to live with it is my general point of view, right? Um, so that was one aspect. It was a materialist thing. Um, the other is it basically said, look, there's nothing wrong with order. You know, human beings are quite good at this. And if you can do it, you should do it. Not everything is complex. And I think the third thing, it basically was a non-static framework. It took a bit of time to get people to understand that. It was more about the dynamics between it. So if you have an ordered system and you relax the constraints so it becomes complex, you release a huge amount of energy into the system, but you lose some control. If you actually want to control it, it takes a huge amount of energy to stabilize it, and it would be very robust, but not resilient. And resilient systems survive by change. Robust systems actually are brittle. They're, they're brilliant until they break, then they don't. Yeah. So that kind of like evolved, all right? Um, and we had some confusion. So at that point, Kinevin is sort of, you know, five domains. Central domain was called disorder, you know, which was kind of like a catch-all. Um, and I could never get people to understand the dynamic movements. 
that they just couldn't cope with a framework with two types of classification. And then my daughter and I were on a father-daughter trip to Naples. Um, she was then in training to be an anthropologist. She's now an award-winning anthropologist right? um, and heading our NHS practice and healthcare practice. She's a medical anthropologist. But we decided we wanted a father-daughter trip and we would study graffiti in Naples. And we also both love Caravaggio. So I was sat in front of Caravaggio's Seven Mercies and his use of light is brilliant. And this is what's called acceptation or abstraction. We now know the science behind this. So that was when I made the liminal domains on Kenevin, because what Caravaggio does is he uses liminal, liminal use of shade and light to, for trans transitions in the painting. It's just wonderful. So that was that overlay. Um, that changed it. And then two years ago, we finally resolved the central domain by calling it the apparatic domain. And that's a reference to Derrida. So I'm quite proud of this. Nobody's managed to get Derrida on the boardrooms of American companies, but I've made it, right? The trouble is British philosophy doesn't think that Derrida is a philosopher, so it hasn't done me any credit in that environment. But Derrida famously said, the only valid quest answer question is a question to which you do not know the answer unless you think differently. And that's called aporia in Greek. Yeah. So that was a central domain. And then it was resolved. Right. So it, it sort of evolved over time. And that's its strength, to be honest. Yeah. It was constantly being picking up on practice and theory. New theory came along. We modified the framework. Yeah. And it's now stable. Um, Fletcher's Curves, which is a second framework, that took about two years to stabilize. Esterine stage two. That's actually stabilized in a year. That's quite scary. But stage three is going to be completely different. And I think that's the thing people don't realize. It's the way physics and science works. You, know, you don't do a one-time study and come up with something absolute. You're constantly learning, checking against reality and developing your frameworks. Okay. Which is why, by the way, it's not a model. It's a framework. Yeah, it is a framework. It seeks to represent reality. A framework gives you a perspective on reality. And one of the things that I've, that I've learned uh, from uh, talking to our common friends, Anna and Hannes, about Kinefin and, and how it's applied or what are consequences for uh, leading organizations, leading companies, is that oftentimes um, people, leaders choose a complicated approach for a situation that is really more in the complex sphere. Yeah. What are other learnings that well, leaders can take away? I mean, there's a problem in what I call North Atlantic thinking. I refuse to call it Western thinking because it isn't Western. Yeah? Uh, North Atlantic is socially atomistic. It focuses on the individual. Whereas if you look at the Celtic fringe of Britain, you look at Southern Germany, Bavaria, you look at Southern Europe, you look at Africa, Asia, they're commutarian cultures. Your primary identity is because you're a member of a community. Yeah? And that's an important distinction. And the problem with the sort of atomistic approach, and you see this in companies, is you get into dichotomies. Sorry, I'm Catholic, so I'm not going to be able to resist this. You know, what happens with the Reformation and the adoption of Neoplatonism is you get this manichae and things are either evil or good. And you know, the famous joke, by the way, is that Augustine took the worst of St. Paul and Calvin took the worst of Augustine. And I will stand by that one. Yeah? So what you get in companies, just to get away from the religion, is you get rigid process, yeah? And everything else is handled by the brilliant inspired leader. And that's just nonsense. So the rigid process doesn't work in a complex environment and the inspired leader is the worst possible approach to the complex environment, but you've got to be really lucky for them to make the right decision. Yeah, so it, it's, it's all of that. And also chaos, people get chaos wrong. They think it exists. I mean, I see this frequently. They say, you know, the traffic in Mumbai is chaotic. Well, it isn't actually. If you walk in a straight line across the road at a constant speed, nothing will hit you. Yeah. Um, the first time I drove the Orfini coast from Sorrento, it felt like chaos. But actually, I now know the way Italian drivers drive. It's follow the next car, match speed, avoid collision. Now I understand the heuristics. I can drive confidently. Right. So those are complex systems. In a chaotic system, and this is where crisis management comes in, this is what we talk about in the U Field Guide, which came out during COVID, is the role of the manager is to stabilize the situation to increase the options, but not to resolve the problem. 
because you can't resolve a problem in a one-time hit. Yeah. And you can see this with the New Zealand Prime Minister in COVID. She locks the country down. Yeah. I mean, there are all sorts of legal issues on that, but she just did it. That meant New Zealand had far more options going forward than the UK or Sweden or the US, who, who didn't take that dramatic action. So they had far fewer options when it came to the process. And I would say actually ended up killing a lot more people. Yeah. I mean, it has that sort of consequence. So there isn't a sort of right or wrong around Kevin Evan. It's and everything will generally belong in several domains. You have to reduce it until you can see it's distinct. That's called granularity. But most of the time you're shifting things between domains. And that's what you're trying to get people to understand. And there are different dynamic movements on that. You don't want things to go into chaos. I find chaotic systems and the forest cycle deeply flawed theoretically and deeply dangerous. Yeah. Because this idea you have to go into chaos to come out is, is a scary one. I was criticizing somebody online this morning because they've got the classic sort of U-shape, you know, in which you have to go into the depths of despair before I, the, you know, your savior coach will lead you out of the despair into the new light and the new enlightenment. And that stuff is crap, right? And it's dangerous crap. So Kinevin is about dynamics. It's about granularity. It's about movement. It's about using different tools in different contexts. It's about effectively, it, it's a sort of weaving, if you want to take that metaphor. And the word Kinevin, it's translated literally into English as habitat. But that actually, nobody in Wales would use it for anything that trivial. What it means, it's an entanglement of multiple threads of history, experience, of which you're only ever partially aware and which is constantly changing. Um, and you're caught up in that flow. Yeah. And you have to effectively navigate that flow. And to be honest, if you slow down, you die. Um, because yeah, you 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 can't, it's not a static environment. And so it's a really good name for the framework. And it also has the advantage is that if somebody doesn't pronounce it properly, you know they haven't got it yet. And it also means you could the word means what you explain it. You can tell a story. People aren't jumping to conclusions. And what I also learned from listening to you is that there is an inherent consequence that there is no such thing as a control illusion. There's no control because anything is entangled with anything. Uh, doing something won't guarantee a certain outcome. You can simply watch. You can observe. You can listen to weak signals. Yeah, you can do a bit more than that. I mean, the, the, one of the big things we put together recently, which we're now pushing out, is the AIMS framework. So that stands for actants, interactions, monitors, and scaffolding. So actants is a really important word. Um, I mean, basically all actors are actants, but not all actants are actors. So it moves people away from thinking about individuals into thinking about design, building, process, etc. cetera. Um, and the key thing, if you're a manager, you have to put monitors in place. You have to see what's happening. And you can't afford to do that with a small group. So again, what we talk about in the U Field Guide is using the whole of your workforce as a, as a monitoring system, which is easy to do, yeah? Um, scaffolding is a sort of combination of constraints and constructors, which gives the system st stability. So there are things you will do in any organizational design which provide that skeleton. It might be an endoskeleton, it might be an exoskeleton. So your fundamental principles is get the scaffolding in place, put the monitors in place, Choose the type of scaffolding appropriate to the level of uncertainty. We have a typology of those. And then modify the actions and the interactions and see what patterns emerge. And if they're good patterns, you flow more energy towards it. If they're bad patterns, you disrupt it. So you are still managing, right? And one of the ways I often explain that is the origin of the word manage in English is an Italian word. I can't pronounce it. I think it's menagori or something like that, which is the ability to ride a horse in dressage. And then that word gets corrupted by the French to mean household management. And it's, so this is menage or manage in effect, right? And basically in a complex world, you're riding a horse. In an ordered world, you're managing a household budget. You're still managing, yeah? And you can still influence it. And the more you can control, the more you're aware of what's going on. The irony is the more control you have. So our newest research project, which is just triggering is on distributed decision making. Yeah, so Thanks. fundamentally, what you can actually get is, and it's like when you walk down the street, you don't think about walking until you stumble. 
So you really want most decisions to be made at a micro level by groups in an organization, but anomalies being triggered to you as a leader. And that's the sort of same principle. Okay. And, and if, I mean, you're, this is all highly abstract and philosophical to a degree, but you went many, many steps further in also building tools in order to help leaders um, to, to sense what's going on. And one of them is the sense maker. Um, can you build a bridge for us? Can FN framework, sense maker, early signal detection, how does that make sense? And what is the role of constraints and narratives and all of that? Okay, so our work exists in the complex domain. Yeah, there are hundreds of methods and tools for order. We don't need to, we just need to interface with those. Yeah. So where we were on the counterterrorism work, yeah, um, was we were looking at this weak signal detection in civilian populations. Um, and if you do conventional questionnaires, you can't trust the result. And you can see this in employee engagement. People know what answer you want. Yeah. And if you want to check that, you end up with 50 page long questionnaires. So you can ask the same question in different ways. And statistically, it, it's just crazy. Right. So you just don't get the right response. Yeah. Um, and we also know that focus groups are biased by the focus group facilitator literally within 30, 40 seconds. They just can't avoid biasing them. Doesn't mean they're not valuable, but they're limited. The only thing which really works is ethnography. In ethnography, if you do it properly, and I, I specialize this, it was my early days in IBM. I would go, I worked for Thames Water, you know, digging holes in the road and dealing with crap, literally crap, right? Um, for two weeks. And I found out more doing that as an apprentice than I ever did as a consultant. And so that's limited ethnography, that's deep immersion. But a true ethnographer will spend a year or two years in the environment before they risk conclusions. Now, we couldn't scale that. Yeah. Although Jen, Joe Jenner and I on Holiday Inns famously um, put an anthropology team into Holiday Inns worldwide to study it. And that was brilliant. They came straight out of Papua New Guinea into Holiday Inns. So they thought it was luxury accommodation. We paid them a research grant, which is less than we pay a McKinsey consultant for a day. And we got really good results, right? So that was working, but the scale thing came in. And I can't remember when we had the idea. And we said, well, why don't we make people their own ethnographers? Then we can scale. And we also wanted a quant approach because qual doesn't scale. Yeah. So that's when we got into the idea. We started to experiment. This really happened after I left IBM at scale. We created the concept of triangles, which have three positive qualities on them. So you can't say anything negative, which reduces the stress. And we really got into what has been quite an exciting route, which is to get school children to gather stories from their community as part of schools projects. And that's using your own citizens as a sensor network to get feedback. Yeah. Now, we're not the first people to do that, but we're the first people to realize that you can't use AI to integrate text. So a lot of people have done this, but then they use algorithms you know, to interpret text. And text is about 5 or 10% of what you know. And also, people know what answers are required. Right? And tone of voice counts. So a project we've just done in the Netherlands, for example, working with old people's homes where we've had continuous narrative capture from nurses residents and relatives so a nurse can take a picture of a patient record a patient's story type their own notes all of that's called a micro narrative then the patient can index it the nurse can index it she can get micro feedback on whether she's seen the world the same way as the patient nobody knows what the right answer is and that system has now replaced the operational system it was designed to complement it now it's the other way around is a narrative is more useful. Um, and we got heavily involved in the development sector. There's a big book published by Oxfam and CRC about all the work they've done over the years with SenseMaker. Yeah, we're working in companies at the moment. Um, again, one of the new things we're working on, we created a Gemba version of the software from that sort of Japanese concept of Gemba, which is to be on the work floor. So we're now using that to actually make your employees as a network. They can capture data as they go along. They don't have to write reports anymore. But then things like microaggression. So if something happens, which you're upset about, and you see this a lot in misogyny, people won't report it until it's so serious, it's an issue. So what you can now do in SenseMaker is you can report it, tag it as a microaggression report, 
And then we look for a pattern in multiple such reports and you never see the origin or the original material. You're just told there's a pattern emerging here, which is what we did in counterterrorism. Yeah? And we can apply that to fraud, we can apply it to racism. So this ethnographic concept of distributing to networks is key. And the other key concept on that is the concept of epistemic justice or epistemic sovereignty. People have the right to interpret their own experience. It's not telling the story which matters, it's the interpretation. And by the way, the original development of this was when I was working with Poindexter to create better training data sets for AI. I mean, 25 years ago, both of us were concerned about that. You're building algorithms, you're not thinking about what they're trained on. And you know, if you know the Scholastic Parrots paper, which was you know written by a Google employee and published by an ex-Google employee because she was fired when she came up with it, which revered the inherent bias in the way their algorithms were working. You see the same in modern AI, chat GPT. Yeah, it's now feeding off its own data. All it's doing is synthesizing other people's material based on probability, which isn't sense making. Yeah. So from our point of view, sense maker was generate training data sets, allow people's own voice to be spoken, but critically find those weak signals you know, within a system. Oh, and okay. by the way, the big thing, and I'll finish on this, is its numbers and its narrative. So numbers are objective, but don't persuade people. Narrative persuades people, but it's an objective. What we did was put the two together. And here is another bit of information that might be interesting for you. If you are interested in topics like complexity, systems thinking, um, transformations uh, in, in businesses or in social settings, you might want to sign up to our LC Impulses. This is a, a regular event which takes place every three weeks. Uh, it's uh, in, in the mornings at eight o'clock German time. And how do you register? You simply enroll to our updates, <clears throat> simply go to our website, www.leadership-choices.com and you will find a pop-up. Just simply fill in your contact information and in which language you want to be addressed. And we'll make sure that you get the updates on these LC impulses, which are for free. Uh, it's, a, it's a nugget, a, a particular model, a particular intervention that might be interesting if you are a leader who is interested in, uh, you know, leadership, in organization tra change and transformation, resilience, all that stuff, all this that we cover at the LC Impulses. And now back to the fascinating conversation with Dave. And we, we experimented with SenseMaker and we found uh, at least two challenges for us, which were, one was, how do you incentivize people to log their narratives? How do you in incentivize people to at best time? What's your, how do you do that? Oh, that's really simple. You, ta you, take, a, you take a task away. I mean, th everybody gets this wrong. And I keep telling the people, you know, in a modern world, if you ask people to do something extra, very few people will do it. So the first time we did this effectively was with the U.S. Army in Afghanistan. And we said to company commanders, keep your records up to date. You don't have to write a patrol report. We got 100 percent compliance. Our recommendation in companies is say, well, if you do this, we'll take away these reporting requirements from you. And we can do that on clinical trials even. And actually, ironically, with chat GDPT, we can now construct those reports from your narratives. So everybody wins. Okay. But you can't. You mustn't incentivize people, yeah, not indirectly. Um, things like the children's project, kids on school programs, nobody refuses to tell them a story, and it's part of the school program. We did the same with sports clubs. So the key thing is to look at the environment. You want sense makers to be embedded in the environment, not as a once-off survey, not as an extra burden, but as a way of saving people time and effort. It's a lot easier to quickly tell a story and index it than to make notes and write your report at the end of the week. And Dave, would you say this is a, a multi-day, multi-week, multi-month intervention, or is this something that you would see it as totally ongoing? Totally ongoing. So it, it's, it's, it's using your employees as a human sensor network. Okay. So we have three uses of SenseMaker. That is what you should do. The second thing, which we often start with, well, we should start with, but most people don't, is what's called mass sense. So you have a current strategic issue faced by the company. You put it together in the infographic, you punch it out to your employees and say, look, we don't know what the hell's going on here. Can you help? We're not surveying. 
they then interpret it, add a micro scenario about what they think will happen next. And if you've got any sense, you show them the results within 48 hours and ask them to comment on the results. So you're not surveying them, you're engaging them in problem solving. Yeah? Okay. And the survey, which is what everybody does first because they think in surveys, that's the least effective. Understood. And um, the other challenge that we found was the actual sense making. So um, the leaders that we work with, I would say their willingness to reflect is limited and the attention span is limited given the times that we live in and all of that. Maybe it was never different. I don't, I don't actually know. But um, do you need a special sort of leader that is willing to go deep and to, to, to sit and, and, and observe and, and stuff like that? What's your... Okay, that's... Analysts have a problem. Yeah, and consultants have a problem because that's what they do. And they think they want to find leaders who do the same thing. And they never will. Yeah. I was sea level. I got five minutes to make decisions. Yeah. So on the other hand, if I give you sense maker and give you something simple and you can play around with it and read the stories, we found people will spend hours on that because they're getting access to material, but you don't, you, you let them find it. Uh, we, one of the things we do for leaders is actually a sacred storybook. So we use SenseMaker to select the important stories. We put them together in a book and, or an, an online system and give those to leaders and say, explore these. And human beings are naturally curious and leaders hardly ever hear the field stories, the water cooler stories, so now they've got a chance. Yeah. So the, th the key thing is to realize the leader is not an analyst. They employ people to do that for them. Yeah. The leader, if they're a good leader, is a pattern sensor. And for example, what I talked about on mass sense, a leader talks to, you know, you're a consultant, you put the thing together, you give them the results back in three graphical pictures, they can click on the graphical pictures, read the material. You've just saved them hours of effort because you're showing what patterns are sustainable or not sustainable in the organization. And key, you're showing, you're finding the people who are thinking differently. If I'm a senior leader, I want to find the people who I'm not being allowed to speak to because middle management are filtering out. That's valuable. And I say, I think the danger is analysts have this belief that everybody should be an analyst. Okay. Yeah. And that's not the case. Okay. Got that. And now I have these information. I have the micro narratives. I see the mainstream. I see the outliers. Now, how do I convert this also with the background of the Canavan framework? How do I convert this into actions or experiments? Okay, well, first of all, a lot of it is insight. So if I've got if I'm working on a new strategy and I can show the dominant patterns of how my employees feel about it, I've got objective evidence of which patterns will resonate and which won't. Right? Now that actually is much more effective than running a survey. Right? So that's understanding that. If I want to do organizational change, so for example, one of the things we do there is we take six cartoons, your employees choose which cartoon they think represents the culture of the company. Now, this is making it more gain, all right? Um, they then index that, we show you the patterns and you can look at that. You can then click on the framework and say, I need more stories like these and fewer stories like those. And that's a whole new theory of change, yeah? Because if I say more like this, fewer like that, everybody can understand it. It's not the abstract language of organizational change specialists. Yeah, it's not. And the key thing on that, and that's where we're starting to move away from things like purpose, mission, value. And to be honest, that's just consultancy industry. Yeah, mission statements became value statements, became purpose statements, and they're about to become deep purpose statements. And there'll be something else after that. Probably eschatological realization because consultants are shameless. And what we do is you then stimulate with those actions, and then you look at the maps again. So what you're doing is a bottom-up stimulation, and you're looking for alignment. Yeah, You're not doing a top-down drive to force conformity. And actually, an alignment allows for requisite variety in the system. Yeah, The last thing you want is to have everybody with common values, common purpose, common sense of direction. Then your organization is dead uh, because it hasn't got enough variety. Okay. So it, it is sense making. It's the ability to. Nobody would dispute the value of a leader walking around and talking to people at the water cooler. Nobody would say what what are the practical actions from that because they can see the value. We're just doing that at scale. It's the same principle. Okay, 
So there needs to be in a leader, there needs to be this curiosity for what's really going on with the people in my organization, which voices do I hear, which do I don't hear, what is spoken about at the board. With, with the odd exception, I've never met a leader who wasn't curious about what was happening because leaders know stuff is filtered before it gets to them. Okay. Uh, the one exception we had was with one of the world's major drink company worldwide, where we had a massive project lined up. I went to the board and the chairman of the board took one look at it and said, why would I want to know this? I've already told them what they should think. <laughs> And he turned to the HR director, he said, pay them their fee and cancel the project. So we we got money for nothing. But it's that that was actually that's that's a bad leader, right? But that is rare. Most leaders are curious. I mean, when we did this with the Navy Navi, all right. So this is the missile defense system for the US Navy, which ironically is based in the middle of the Mojave Desert, right? For reasons nobody understands. And it's a company term. And they have fairly high turnover of commandants because it's a it's a process if you're a two-star general you get sent there to see if you can make three star which is a big jump yeah so they have a high turnover of commanders all right so what we did is when a new commander came in we basically searched for stories within certain categories with high emotional intensity and we put those into a book with a graphic artist and we gave it to the company commander before he came and they all read it cover to cover. In fact, they were well thumbed. And then they would quote stories from it in communication rather than telling their own story. So I think the issue is to, it's everything in complex is not big projects where you can say, I did this, it had this miraculous effect. And to be honest, anybody who tells you that in the consultancies is lying, right? Whenever we did field ethnography, it's more awareness, more small things. Yeah, that's what complexity is about. And in what what I've been hearing you saying is that this is it, it talks about systems and yet it is different than systems thinking. How do you how do you draw the line? What's the big difference? Okay, so I mean I I was stronger on this in the early days because if you're creating something or working on something which is new, you have to be stronger on the differences. I'm now more relaxed because most people realize they're different. Yeah. So in systems thinking, you've got systems dynamics, yeah, which was Forrester and then Peter Senge. Those are those huge causal feedback loops. Uh, which Stan McChrystal, who actually used Kenevin in Afghanistan, famously said when he looked at it, if we ever understand that, we've won the war. And the trouble is the people who created it thought that was a compliment, all right, which is even more depressing. So most of the people I know in systems thinking actually do not like being associated with Senge systems dynamics because they know it's a sort of crude causality. Um, cybernetics, which is the other big field, right? Um, I don't think Stafford Beer would have created the VSM model if he'd known about complexity theory. I think he was brilliant, but he was, you know, that's a scientific limitation. But the pattern languages of Alexander, Patrick Hofstetter, we can work with those because they're micro patterns. Yeah? And that has utility. The trouble is they're too coarsely grained, so we break them down. Soft systems is where I came from, as Michael Jackson did and others, and that's hugely valuable, but it's a workshop technique, so it doesn't scale. The other general characteristic, I have a special award for original thinking and systems thinking, which I got last year, which is ironic from Mike Jackson when he gave it me, did say it was ironic, right? Because I'd just given a lecture on why, why we had to move on. Um, generally in systems thinking, they say that systems have boundaries. In complexity thinking, we basically say some do, but they don't have to, yeah? And so there's a lot of work in systems thinking done around boundary management and the problem with kind of complex system, you've got dissipative structures. Yeah. So boundaries are problematic. Uh, the other big difference is if you look at the popular forms of system thinking, I would say the academics as well, they start by getting people together in a room and agreeing what they want to achieve and asking them to think systematically. Complexity doesn't do that. We, we map where we are in the present. And then we see what journeys are sustainable, what I call the Frozen 2 strategy, yeah, which is from Frozen 2, the Disney movie, um, where the young sister, who's the real heroine, in a state of despair, which is complex, sings, all I can do is do the next right thing. So I can make, and that's in complexity, is called an adjacent possible. So in complexity, we start journeys with a sense of direction. Yeah. And that opens us up to possibilities on the pathway, which if we have specific goals, we won't. Yeah? And I think this inherent thing about uncertainty, so systems thinkers will tell you quite rightly they've dealt with complexity all their lives. Yeah? And I don't disagree with that. 
but we built canals and used gravity before Newton came along. Now we've got the science. Yeah, and that changes things. So huge amount of respect for system thinking. I was involved in the LSE experiments, early stage cybernetics with Frank Land and people like that. But the science has moved on. It's like, you know, um, single and double loop learning. That was a really good idea in the 80s. Mental models were a good idea in the 80s. We now know neither of them correspond with the natural science. It doesn't mean they were wrong at the time. They were coherent, but we need to move on. Mm -hmm. And what I find so interesting about your work is that it is, it's, I mean, it's very deep on the theoretical side, but then there's also super, super cool applications. I, I, I heard you talk about that you played a role in the negotiations between the Colombian government and the FARC, for example, uh, using this. I mean, what were some of the oddest applications for or most significant or... No, that, well, that wasn't odd. We were looking at where there was common attitudes and beliefs between warring parties. And that's something we do in companies. I mean, there's often more conflict in companies. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's... I mean, natural science has always been deeply pragmatic. I mean, the irony is people say it's academic. It isn't. It's, it's you know, it works. Yeah. Um, it's called praxis. And we, you know, the joke we used to make in the 70s is praxis makes perfect. Right. So once you understand the core science, you can work with what we might call an essential simplicity. Yeah. So it's deeply practical very quickly, but not in the way that people are used to. And I mean, the, the core metaphor I use on that, that a lot on this is to say, look, guys, you need to be chefs, not recipe book users. Yeah, a recipe book user is fine. You know, they can pick the recipe, they can stack up the ingredients, everything works until they don't have the right ingredients, or they don't have a kitchen. So I was in Dublin not so long ago, best muscles I've had in my life with a guy with two rings and three saucepans who is producing meals just like this, yeah? And he's a chef because he understands the principle of taste. He's trained his body to understand how to cook. And that takes about five or six years, all right, before you get it. And we need to move into a world where there are more chefs and few people who demand recipes. Okay. Uh, so many questions there I want to ask. Uh, add to that but um moving on to um, a bit more recent not very recent but more recent development of your thinking estrarine mapping yeah can you build a bridge how to apply that in an organization okay so that's a good example of how it worked all right so i came across constructor theory in physics at the hay festival which i go to and the hannes go there as well Played around with it, looked really interesting. So the concept in constructor theory is that it's sometimes known as the science of can and can't. So that's called a counterfactual boundary. So we can't change gravity. And then they came up with the concept of constructors. A constructor is something which transforms things, but doesn't substantially change in the act of transformation. Yeah. Now, so in our terms, a constructor, if you, you a ritual is is a constructor, that's by passage. But actually you can also, if something inspires you, that's by contamination. Yeah, so the thing itself doesn't change, but it produces an impact. So that theory was really interesting. Um, and we were also working with Alicia Girara stuff on constraints. So the constraint-based definition is fundamental to Knevin. And I started to put the two together, right? You know? And I was thinking, well, energy is key on this. and one of the things I'm playing around with is some new ideas in physics, which says that information may have mass, but as a fifth type of matter, and that would explain dark matter. That's really interesting for me, because if information has mass, it has momentum, that would explain a lot of things. Yeah. So we started to say evolution tends towards energy minimization. Yeah. And then I was coming across some consultants who are heavily into constructional law and Bayesian's work. Yeah. And I remember saying in deep frustration, would you please stop talking in terms of rivers where everything flows in one direction? Yeah, which in Deleuzean terms is arboreal. And the trouble is if you cut it off high enough in the stem, everything dies. I said it's rhizomic. Yeah, so this is, yeah, everything is connected with everything else, which is complexity. And I said it's a goddamn estuary, not a river. 
And in estuary, the water flows backwards as well as forwards. Yeah, if so you've this got is a low where a river powered... meets the sea, right? That's it. And so if you've got a low powered boat, you can cross the estuary at the turn of the tide, but not when the tide is flowing. Yeah, the brackishness of the water, the salt clean water boundary is critical to understand in the estuary. There are sandbanks which change every day. Granite cliffs change every 50 years. So it was a wonderful metaphor for the organization. So then we basically said, look, there are three things we can capture. Actants, when we talked about that earlier, constraints, constructors. We then map them onto a grid in which the vertical dimension is the energy cost of change. The horizontal dimension is the time to change. And the process of that is if you can't agree, break it down till you agree. This is designed to be a model, a situational assessment, which has no disputes in it. And that gets the right level of granularity. And then people draw three lines on it. Yeah, one line sort of handles off the northeast part of the model framework, sorry. Um, and those are the things which won't change. The energy cost is too high. The time is too high. Then we add a liminal area, which basically is these probably won't change. But if somebody else did, yeah, it's kind of like we might be able to. The rest is what's called an affordance landscape. Is these are the things we can actually change. So then people go through those at this finely grained levels and they say, well, yeah, if we could reduce the energy cost of this, this would be good news. Right. Come up with a project. Actually, for this one, we want to increase the energy cost because it's vulnerable. That's our final boundary. Yeah, We want to make it difficult for this change. Or this one, we want to disrupt or destroy. This one, we want to monitor. Yeah, so there's a whole series of actions. And you end up with 50 or 60 small things to change the energy gradients of where you are so that good things are easier to happen. And that actually now sells as a pre-process. I think post-COVID, this took off. It's, I've been absolutely surprised in one year we've gone we've gone where we took it took eight about 10 years to go in Kinevin and I think it's a simple framework it appeals to people and people understand it and I think one of the things I coined the phrase up front I said you want to make the energy cost of, of sin higher than the energy cost of virtue and I think people get that and it also challenges the systems thinking approach because it said if you have everybody together in a workshop you agree where you want to do, you're going to end up in a counterfactual zone, which is why these projects fail. So if you want to understand this correctly, does this approach also help in assuming I've done my sense making, I've done my narrative gathering, and I want to de design steps forward, uh, something that I want to do more of so that more good things happen in, in, in the sense of the what I want to achieve for my organization. Does estuarine mapping help me to do that or to find out uh, the right it, steps? It, it, it's the thing we've done to, as an alternative to mental models and mindset, right? Which are not valid concepts. They're cognitively framed when consciousness is distributed. So we say, look at agency affordance assemblage, right? So the estuarine map creates your affordance landscape. That says what, what we can actually change. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So you can't plant cactus in a paddy field, right? Is, is the way it's said it. Agency is easy to manage. Assemblage is what comes from sense maker. So those are the narrative patterns which act like attractor wells and people fall into them and they can't escape them. So we and we tend to look at assemblages and say, well, some aspects of those are actually constraints or constructors. But some of them also we have these more like this fuel like like, like, that, like that actions. And we take the actions, the change actions on energy gradients, they're more like this actions, and they get mapped onto Kinevin and then clustered. Yeah, so that's how it hangs together. Okay, well, um, Dave, I would like to come to your life real quick. Well, real quick, uh, that's probably a longer thing, but how did you find your, I mean, I would like to know, young Dave, I know that your father was a vet, a veterinarian, right? What, what were things that influenced you? Were you, in hindsight, something that was important to you in your youth? Oh, well, you, you probably need to understand, in Wales, you need to understand we're a matriarchy. Um, that, yeah, Welsh ma'am is a fearsome beast, and I had one. Um, but she was actually born, you know, in, in an impoverished area of Cardiff. I only found that out when I was thinking of moving there, and I, I phoned her up, and she said, you're not going back there. I mean, it's now luxury, right? Um, but then it was, it was, I think, above a whorehouse was where she was born. And she fought her way out with a scholarship, including studying German in Germany in the late 1940s. 
You know, she had to wear a passport so that she wouldn't get raped uh, by British and American soldiers. And, and she got a first class honours in German, right? I mean, and that's a Welsh tradition, by the way, is education. Yeah. And so she was fierce. As far as she was concerned, education was it. So I'd read the whole of the Bible by the time I was 11. Yeah. But she said, I wouldn't understand European literature if I didn't know my Bible. And she's right. I, I, the punishment was I became a Catholic and she's an atheist, was an atheist, right? And then she, you know, having done that, I went up to Shakespeare. She never told me to do this, but you it was indicated you might want to do it, all right? And you didn't defy that. And we the, the kitchen table was constant arguments. I mean, that's you know, arguing, you know, arguing for the fun of it, right? Just to see where you go. I should have warned my wife about that because when they decided they liked it, they tore into something she said. She was part of the family game. And then from the age of 11 to 18, every week in the school I was in, you were given a subject and a side. So I remember walking up to the front of the class and I got given a card, you support capital punishment. First one I ever had, 11. And my mother was leading the campaign again. It's capital punishment for the Lost Labour Party. So this is the teacher having fun. You know? And I had to speak for seven minutes without preparation for something I didn't believe that. We did that every week from 11 to 18. That was a one that made us generalists. And I think there aren't many generalists left. I'm one of them. Yeah. And generalists synthesize or suck up a whole bunch of things. Yeah. The other thing, and it was a late diagnostic, I'm dyslexic. It wasn't picked up at school in those days. I can't spell. It's difficult to and difficult to pronounce as I've heard something 15 or 16 times. But dyslectics see connections between things. And you get really frustrated because people don't. And then, yeah, I was going to be a Jesuit, but I failed the test of obedience. I lasted seven months in the Jesuits and seven years in IBM with the same problem, but the Jesuits were more mature. And then worked, as I say, programmed to combat racism. That got me involved in indigenous rights in Australia. And it was genocide in Australia in the 70s. It wasn't racism. It was genocide. Right? Um, and then came back into industry. So I think I've always been curious. And one of the things I was taught in the family, dad was a stable guy and he was a vet and I went around with him and, and mum was the, the fierce one, right? Was just to do what you think is right and assume it will sort out around you. And it's got me into trouble from time to time, but I carry on doing it. Yeah, and if if I'd done, yeah, there's a Mullen Nas Redeem story, it's worth knowing, all right? So I kept getting these people in IBM saying, compromise what you're doing, just make it look familiar. And I said, well, if I do that, it won't be what I'm doing. Yeah. And then there's this lovely story, because in Sufi philosophy, you argue by stories, not by not, not by logic. Yeah. And the Mullah Nasruddin lives in a city. He's only ever seen pigeons before. He's the wise fool. And one day a falcon lands on his windowsill and he says, oh, you poor bird. So he clips its beaks and clips its wings and clips its talons. So it looks like a pigeon. And he says, now you're a real pigeon. Now you're a real bird. And I used to put that up in front of anybody who told me to compromise what I was doing and say, do you want the falcon or do you want the pigeon? Yeah. And you have to be patient. I mean, you know, complexity is taking off at the moment. It's been 20 years and it's been a hard struggle. Yeah. And if you if you try on, I mean, somebody that thinks so deeply about the nature of things and, and how to use science to, you know, make progress also as a society, if you turn on the nose, how do you feel these days? If I work, sorry? When you turn on the nose right now, I mean, in the past months, is there, I find it very depressing right now, but is that... Oh, only... right. Yeah, but I mean, there's, I mean, in Catholic theology, um, to give up hope is a mortal sin. And a good friend of mine, Terry Eagleton, wrote a wonderful book called Hope Without Optimism. Yeah. And a lot of the stuff like we, we want to build every 17 year old in every school in the world as a sensor. And we're getting close to getting that funded. There are things we can do. Yeah. And as long as there are things we can do, you just keep going. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I've done a lot of work on peace and reconciliation. I was on a podcast yesterday to a group of Israelis, which I agreed to do, provided they translated it into Arabic and distributed it. Yeah. And one of the things I said is, look, the current conflict, you can't do anything about that. Yeah. But you can start to prevent, for, start to prepare for what happens after the conflict. 
Yeah, and you can start to create resilience in your families, right? So, you know, we, we're going to face water starvation. There's the chance of mass heat deaths. You know, temperature will go above 58 for more than two or three hours. The world is going to be a very difficult place, right? But, you know, we lost two thirds of our population in the medieval plagues. And, and by the way, that's the other nasty thing which is about to happen. We're about to get some more plagues. You have to keep a, a light shining somewhere, I think, is the principle. Okay, well, thank you uh, for all this uh, tour through your life and the your the, you know the, your thinking. What's maybe one thing that's still on your well, maybe there's many things actually that are still on your bucket list where you say this is something that I still have to do in my life. Oh, distributed decision making we're working on, right? That's the next thing, and and I think I'm the personality type. If I ever retire, I'll probably die within the year, right? I mean, I want to do more walking and Brexit. There, there's always more stuff. This concept, and the science is changing. I just said, if information has mass, everything is going to change. Uh -huh. Yeah, discoveries on epigenetics, you know, Eva Jablonka's work. If you start with the science and you think about how that works for social systems, there's always something new and exciting to work with. Wow. Well, okay. Dave, thank you so much. That was absolutely Real fascinating. Pleasure. Um, all the best to you and uh, speak soon, I would say. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a Thank lot. Thank you, Dave. Have a good day. Bye-bye. So, that was Dave Snowden. Um, that could have been 10 more podcasts, I would say, probably on each and every topic. Um, what are your thoughts, reflections, questions, anything that struck you in particular? Please write us a note at leaderstalk at leadership minus choices.com we're looking very much forward to your feedback to your reflections and now all the best to you stay healthy and uh, yeah talk to you next time at leaders talk bye for now <laughs>